This is part two of lecture three. In this part, we'll be discussing automatic thinking. And in order to understand human behavior, it is good to know that we have different systems for processing information. So if we are on the lookout for new information or we're trying to make judgments on our social worlds, we can do so in two different ways, basically. So we can do so in a controlled way, using controlled thinking. And when we, do, uh, when we use controlled thinking, we uh, are very deliberative. We think about information carefully. This is a, quite a slow process. It's careful, it's conscious. It's also effortful. So you're probably using this information maybe while you're watching this lecture, also when you're studying for an exam, also when something is really important to you and you start th really thoroughly thinking about it, you want to make a good decision. Um, so this system is great because it really helps us to use our brain to the full capacities. It's not flawless. We'll be discussing the controlled system in uh, part three of today's lecture. But it's actually definitely uh, sort of the, the more advanced system compared to the second system, which is automatic thinking. When we use automatic thinking, we're basically going on autopilot. Uh, this is very quick, it's intuitive, it's unconscious, and it's efficient because it is automatic. So it's, you don't need any resources in order to use this system. If you're not doing your best at all, you're relying on automatic thinking. And human beings use this a lot because we are a bit lazy and it's really tiring to use this control thinking all the time. Uh, also, there are some individual differences on preferences. Some people really love complex thinking. They love puzzles. They love really to use their brain. And others are not so interested in doing so. So these are also the people that really love studying and love reading compared to people that have different hobbies. So this automatic uh, route actually has a lot of benefits uh, as well. Uh, we'll be discussing this automatic uh, thinking uh, um, process in just a bit. But let me first uh, sort of uh, show you when we use the different systems. So first of all, it's important to realize that we rely on the uh, control system when we're really invested in a certain idea, if we really want to make a good decision if it, we are motivated to think thoroughly, if we also have the capaci capacity to do so. When, so when we are not so tired, when we are not distracted, then we are using the control system. And other times, we tend to use the automatic system. Uh, one factor that's also influential is our mood. So when we are in a good mood, you feel relaxed, you feel happy, we're actually more likely to use the automatic system. And that is because it's our intuitive system. So the moment we, start, we feel good, we feel sort of confident that our gut feeling is correct. And we start relying more on our route for automatic thinking. When we are in a bad mood, when we are sort of, you know, uh, uh, grumpy, things are not going our way, we have more resistance to using the automatic system. We are more on guard, basically. So therefore, we are actually more likely to use the controlled system. Uh, so mood impacts which type of system we use. And mood also impacts the information we see in the world. So this is a uh, result of a study in which people were placed uh, in either a good or a bad mood. And researchers have clever ways of doing so, for example, by letting participants watch a certain movie clip that is either really funny and relaxed and positive or, you know, very negative. So you place people in either a good mood or a bad mood. And after doing so, uh, the researcher showed a certain video clip to the participants. And they basically just asked a simple question, so how many negative behaviors do you see in this video clip? Or how many positive uh, behaviors do you see in this video clip? The video clip was exactly the same for everyone. But the results showed something interesting. So the moment that people were placed in a good mood, so beforehand the researchers did an experiment, manipulation, good mood, bad mood. If you're in a good mood, you actually detect less negative behaviors and you detect more positive behaviors if you're put in a good mood. If you're being put in a bad mood, it's the opposite. So you actually detect more negative behaviors and you detect less positive behaviors. So this is actually, again, in line with this idea of confirmation bias. So the moment you feel good, you see all good things happening in the world. And when, 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 you feel, when you feel bad, when you don't have your day, and I think we can all relate to that, sometimes everything just seems to be going wrong on one day. You're like, how is this possible? All, everything goes wrong in this one day. It's probably because you're on the lookout also for bad things to happen, because you're already in a bad mood. 
So mood impacts the system we use, automatic versus controlled. It's also uh, impacting the way we interpret events in the world. Uh, one other thing that I want to point out before going in detail talking about um, uh, the automatic thinking, um, that is that culture also impacts the way we see the world around us. So uh, basically what we know is that people fr uh, from different cultures, um, especially people from the Western world, more individu individualistic countries, have a different processing style than people from uh, more collectivistic countries, and that's also impacting the way they perceive the world. So, uh, for example, look at this this picture over here. Here, several things are going on, um, and people from different cultures were being asked to to look at this picture for a certain period of time. Later on, this picture disappeared, and they were being asked the question: So, what do you remember from the picture? And uh, what is interesting is that people from West Western countries actually saw different things, remember different things than people from uh, more uh, collectivistic countries, like East Asian country, uh, countries uh, such as uh, China and Korea. And what is interesting is that uh, people uh, from these different cultures also have a different uh, processing style. So people from an uh, individualistic country have a more analytic thinking style. And if you have an analytic uh, thinking style, you focus more on the properties of ob objects um, without considering the surroundings. So for example, if for, probably if you're from a, a Western country, or I am from a Western country, I'm from the Netherlands, if I look at this picture, I am focused on, for example, the car, uh, that there are some animals in the back of the car. I'm uh, focusing maybe on the scarecrow in the front uh, of this picture. So details of the objects. I'm not really looking at the surroundings. While people from, from uh, East Asian cultures, they look more globally on what is going on. So, for example, they tend to watch the overall context and think about uh, the trees in the back, maybe the farms that you see. So you actually perceive this, this uh, picture differently. And this, is, this difference between analytic thinking style and holistic thinking style is important, and it's going to come back later. Uh, and I think it's, for now it's important to know that it's also impacting the way we perceive the world and, and uh, how we process information. So let's now zoom into this automatic thinking. What is it exactly and how do we use it? So I mentioned already, if you use automatic thinking, you're going on autopilot. You're not really thinking at all. It's just going automatic. That's why it's called the automatic thinking style. And if you do so, we rely on heuristics. And heuristics are sort of mental shortcuts that allow us to very quickly and efficiently make uh, decisions. So um, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to show you several examples of heuristics of these mental shortcuts for you to get a sense of, of what I mean uh, by them. Um, so to introduce the first heuristic, let me ask you a question. So which mode of transportation do you think is more dangerous? Is this flying or is this going by car? So most of you, I hope that you're now using your controlled system for making decisions, then probably if you use rationalization, you probably know it's the car, right? There's way more, the pr probability of you to get in a car accident is way, way, way higher than for you to get in a plane accident. However, if you use the automatic system, intuitively, people are often more afraid of planes than of cars. There's way more people that are terrified to go on a plane while they would easily uh, hop in the car, even though they know that uh, going by car is actually more uh, dangerous. So why is this? This is because of the first heuristic, which is called the availability heuristic. Uh, this heuristic is used uh, when it comes to um, making judgments of how often something happens. Basically, uh, the question that is... Um, raised in this heuristic is how quickly does something come to mind? So when you think about plane crashes, that probably comes to mind more quickly than car crashes. And also if you think about a plane crashing, of course the consequences are much more severe often than when a, you have an accident with a car, uh, even though they can of course also be very dangerous. So planes and danger, that's just more available in our minds, that this is a dangerous mode of uh, transportation. So um, the availability heuristic is used when we try to estimate the frequency or uh, the probability of a certain uh, event. And uh, we often also, when we use this, this, uh, this heuristic, it can help us, but it can also, uh, we, we also oftentimes make errors because how available information is, is oftentimes not informative on how, you know, how probable 
uh, uh, a certain event is. So let me give you two examples of this. So um, let's, let's consider the following question. Do you think there are more words with the letter R as the first letter or with R as the third letter? If you think about this. If I, have, if I ask you to quickly decide on this, most people will say there are probably more words with R as the first letter. And that is because it's way easier to think of words that start with an R than that have R as the third letter. That's really quite difficult to, to think about. And because words with R as the first letter are more available, we judge, we decide that there are more words that start with an R than have R as the third letter, even though that's not correct. Uh, another completely different example, something that uh, I think you might relate to when you work in groups, is that oftentimes uh, people, when they have to do an assignment together, for example, students uh, have to do an assignment together, and you ask them later, so who contributed the most to this group assignment? Then a lot of people say, I did. And within a group, a lot of people will say that they felt like they contributed the most. It also has something to do with the availability heuristic, also with with uh, positive illusions that we have about our, our own capacities and our own work, but also definitely with availability. Because your own work, what your contribution was, that's very easily accessible. That's something that comes to mind very easily. And therefore, you often decide uh, that you think that you did the most, just because your own work is most available for you. Okay, uh, now let's move on to the second heuristic. Um, the second heuristic has to do with people. Uh, let's imagine you meet this uh, guy over here. And uh, I ask you, so what do you think is the favorite activity of this person? Is it live action role playing or is it football, playing soccer? What do you think? What is his hobby? I think a lot of people would sort of intuitively say it's probably live action role playing. And that is because we rely on a heuristic when we watch people. The moment we meet a person, we start categorizing this person. You meet this person, this is quite a prototypical nerd. It's sort of an exaggeration of a nerd. And we have this idea that nerds have certain hobbies. They maybe like uh, live action role playing more than playing football. So when we make this decision, this is purely based on a heuristic of representativeness. And this heuristic uh, means that we sort of uh, make judgments by comparing how similar a person is to a certain prototype. So the picture I showed you over there, quite similar to the prototypical nerd, right? So therefore you place them in a certain category and we make judgments. We decide what this person likes, what this person dislikes based on this uh, heuristic. So uh, this is a great heuristic sometimes because it can help us make judgments about people and oftentimes we're right but oftentimes we're also wrong and the moment this goes wrong is when we make uh, errors on the base rate information so base rate information i'll explain this concept this m basically means um, that um, how uh, that we misjudge how frequent something occurs and some hobbies like football are very popular. So a lot of guys around the age of uh, the person you saw in the picture play football, have a hobby that is football. And actually, uh, very little people do live action role playing. So if you look at the relative frequency of events, actually, you, it would be an, a, a better bet to say that this person plays football or soccer than live action role playing, just because the odds are so different the odds for any person to play football are much higher than the odds of any play person uh, uh, engaging in live action role playing. So let me give you a second example just to clarify this concept of base rate information a bit further. Uh, here you see uh, Selma. Uh, Selma, as you see here, she has a very, uh, you know, uh, extravagant uh, clothing style. Um, she uh, uh, describes herself as someone with a free spirit. Uh, she's quite extroverted and she is also a student. And uh, your job is to estimate what Selma studies. So um, Selma studies at a university with 400 psychology students and 10 art students. What does Selma study? So here you have information about sort of a stereotype activation and you have base rate information. And if you would use the represent, uh, representation, representation uh, heuristic, you probably would guess 
that uh, Selma is an art student, just because she fits this box so nicely. But if you would take into account the base rate information, you would actually uh, estimate that the chances for her to be a psychology student are so much higher. So maybe it's just statistically a better bet to say that she studies uh, psychology. So this is all I wanted to say about uh, the automatic thinking style. In the next part, we're going to be discussing the control thinking style.